Welcome back to the series. The motherboard is back. I'm already giving you a preview of what it will look like when it's populated. Uh, but I want to start by telling you a mistake I made in the design about the reset circuit. Uh, it was such a silly mistake that is not really characteristic of me. It scared me. I thought, well, if this was my level of attention designing this board, what else did I do wrong? Turns out that nothing else apparently uh, is wrong. It was just that. But I removed the board design from the rep repository because I thought I, I don't want to run any risk of anyone going there and making that board with the wrong reset circuit. The bodge for it is very, very simple. As you can see in these images, you just I just lifted a pin uh, of one of the inverters and I took out uh, the entire circuit about the reset button, which we don't really need. I'm going to explain this to you in detail, but uh, it's it was completely soluble even on the board I have it was very easy to budge and I will explain to you what the mistake is in the meantime the design files for the motherboard are already back in the repository keep in mind um, it is still if you do if you m have them made it's still uh, something you do at your own risk because I didn't do the integration test yet and chances are that at least one of the five boards do need to be changed because I will find something that is wrong when I put it all together. I haven't done it yet. So you do that at your own risk. Let me show you and explain what the mistake was, what the silly mistake was. So I'm using a snapshot uh, of a previous video because I actually already modified the design. So <laughs> I, I didn't have uh, any more uh, this loaded in the, the EDA tool. Um, what I basically did, I eliminated this part here. I mean, this, this chip actually stayed because this is an inverter and it's used for other things here and here. Um, but uh, this, I just took out of the circuit, it's not needed. And uh, this part here underneath related to the reset signal, uh, that's not used anymore. Now, why was this not working? Um, if you look at this signal here, that's the reset. It originally comes from this push button, which has a little bit of debouncing. Then it uh, goes in here into the inverter. And this inverter has hysteresis. It inverts the signal twice and it comes out here. And the hysteresis um, helps debounce it even more. It takes away uh, instability uh, of the signal. We've discussed this in one of the early episodes. Um, the problem is the following, because I am inverting it through an, uh, um, a 74 logic inverter. Now this signal here is no longer open collector. That's a push and pull signal now. And this is what I'm connecting there. So what happens is when the FTDI adapter tries to pull the reset line down to activate it, this chip here will sense that it's going down and we'll try to keep it up and we'll provide more current out through this line here to try to keep the level at 5 volts because this is the logic level it's supposed to maintain. So even if I pull it down here, this guy will be trying to keep on providing current, a lot of current, to keep the signal up. Uh, so you effectively create a sort of a, a, a pseudo short circuit. So the solution for this is, is just to remove uh, this whole thing here. We don't really need it. I mean, uh, in Cerberus 2080, I also didn't put a reset signal because the I.O. controller can reset itself. There is a way to do it. It's, it's part of the data sheet of the specs of this I.O. controller. It can reset itself without uh, the need for an external button. This can be done even in the firmware. And in Cerberus, if you remember, I can just type reset on the BIOS and the, the I.O. controller, which is called CAT uh, in the case of Cerberus, uh, it's also an Atmega, it's a smaller Atmega, it's an Atmega 328P, not a 1284. Uh, but if you type reset on the BIOS, it resets itself and, and both CPUs of Cerberus as well. So there is no reason to really uh, insist uh, on this button here, so I just, uh, I just took it out. Now, as usual, the first thing we do is to inspect the boards when they arrive from the manufacturers. It's it's very common and it's not a bad thing. It just happens that you get scratches on the board. Um, I got one of the boards. Uh, it had been scratched and I could see the repair work that uh, they did at PCBWay. It was, it was very well done, very properly done. There's no reason to throw a large board like this away because of a little scratch uh, across a couple of traces if it can be repaired. 
So the board is good and then I populated it. There you can see the, the power area, uh, the, the, the safety fuse and uh, the 3.3 volt regulator have uh, some, some uh, heat sinks around them. Some side ports for the FTDI adapter, for the micro SD card adapter. That little orange wire you see there is that I'm, I'm forcing the um, PC output enable, the program counter output enable down to ground because that's what the board that will be connected there would do. Um, and I will be testing this motherboard without the other boards connected. So this is the I.O. controller, the crystal oscillator you saw in there. Those are the registers and the respective drivers that uh, can drive the address and data lines of the two memories, which you see on top. Those larger chips are the instruction and the data memories. Um, there are decoupling capacitors uh, uh, everywhere in the board. That big yellow square there, that's the resettable fuse. Um, those round black devices, uh, uh, those are to prevent um, current surge when you turn on the device. We've discussed this before. Uh, you see the reset button there. It, it has been installed, but it's out of the circuit because I lifted the pin of uh, one of the pins of the inverter. You see the track of power DC to DC converter there that generates the 5 volt line. The regulator with the heat sink generates the 3.3 volt line. That's a linear regulator. And that's an overview of the board. So let's begin testing. I have the blue probe of my oscilloscope, the blue one, connected to the 12 volt line, AC coupled, so we only see uh, uh, the rippling, we don't see the DC value. The scale is 50 millivolts per division, so we can see the ripple. The yellow probe I will now put on the 12 volt line after decoupling to see if it's a little more stable, and it is a little more stable, that's what's going to the CPU cards. Now let's have a look at the 5 volt line. Um, there is a long ground wire in the probe, so you see some, some interference that is not there, but it's quite stable. Quite happy with that as well. That's after the DC to DC converter, which plays the role as switch mode regulator. It's well within the 5 millivolt range that we'd like to see. I lost the 12 volt line now, it disconnected. <laughs> I'm measuring the 3.3 the, the volt line, but I lost the 12 one. Uh, so ignore the 12 volt line in blue. I, I think I'll reconnect it as I decided to reconnect it just to make a nice video. <laughs> That's the 12 volts back. Everything is AC coupled. So that will be the 3.3 volt line. And that's linearly regulated from the 5 volt and that's super clean. 50 millivolts per division. This is really zoomed in and we can hardly see any noise. And that's again the 5 volt line measured on another point and I've been picking up less interference there. So you see that the signal is quite stable. I'm, I'm very happy with the voltages. Um, so now I'm going to switch off uh, channel 2. Hopefully I'll get that done. <laughs> yes, channel 2 is switched off. I'm going to switch channel 1 to DC uh, uh, mode now because now I want to see the signal transitions from 0 to 5 and 5 to 0. I changed the scale to 1 volt per division and I believe now we will look at the clock. First I'm getting rid of the blue probe, don't need to, don't need to look at the 12 volt line anymore, set it aside and let's try to find the clock going into the I.O. controller from the crystal. Uh, let's see if I will find it. Yes, there is. There, there, there is the clock, or is, is that right? No, that's not right, because I'm still at 50 millivolts per division, I think. Yeah, and I'm picking up just uh, the, the noise from a clock line. <laughs> that, that was not right. Uh, let's change the scale to 1 volt per division, as I should have done to begin with. Yeah, you see that uh, the noise is amplified. The noise is at the frequency of the clock, of course, because everything switches with the clock. Now that is the clock line. Let me reduce, increase the trigger a little bit so the signal is stable, change the scale so we can see the shape. And it's a very nice sinusoidal signal. And I'm getting exactly 18.432 megahertz. Uh, so it's bang on, right? Let's now look at the clock divider that generates the clock for the CPU cards. There we go. Uh, I'll change the scale so we so we see the original clock signal. It's, it's, it's not divided now, I think. Very little division. So if I increase the division, you see the, the, the clock gets slower. 
change the scale. Let me go back to the original state. So this is the original clock with very little division. And I will add more division, division factors. And you see, and it gets slower and slower. And it, um, it has no ringing. It's a nice square wave. And you see the frequency there is 500 something kilohertz. I can't see anymore, but it was 500 something. That's the slowest clock the divider can generate for the CPU. I'm quite sure it will run faster than that, but we can generate a very, very slow clock. So this is it for uh, the electrical S of the board. As you can see on the bottom, I already have the FTDI adapter connected. And to the right, I have the RS-232 serial line connected to my computer. So let's test it that way now. I'll be using my PC to control uh, Talos. You see my little RS-232 terminal window there. On, the, on my screen, you see an echo of what I will be typing. Uh, but only what I type on the main keyboard will be registered. I'm now typing a command, IPIC. It stands for Instruction Memory Peak. I'm picking what is on address 0. And uh, I get 0 there. And now I'm do doing an I poke. Uh, I poked FF to address 0. And then I pick it again. And there we have FF. Now I'm doing the same thing but for the data memory. D picking address FFFF. It was 0. Now I poke 55 <laughs> hexadecimal on it and then I pick it again and there we have it's 55. This means that I can read and write to both instruction and data memories and that's the key functionality that the I.O. controller has to do to pick and poke to the data memory and the instruction memory. And I'm doing some more peaks and pokes just to satisfy myself that I can do it to multiple addresses and that the peaks don't confuse the two memories and neither do the pokes and then everything is working uh, just fine. Um, the Arduino sketch that does this uh, will be on the repository right now as well. So this is it folks, the basic tests uh, are done. Everything seems to work, almost everything. I didn't test everything, but most of it is working. At least most of it is working according to design intent. The question is whether the design intent is correct. And that I will only know when I put all five boards together. But before I can do it, I need to develop the firmware a little bit more to recognize the assembly instructions of Talos. And that would take me some time. I'm slower with software than I am with hardware. Uh, I'll be doing that in the coming couple of weeks and hopefully I'll be bringing good news soon. Hopefully to all be working and there will be a show of blinking lights <laughs> as uh, the instructions are processed through this three-stage pipeline CPU that can execute up to four operations in parallel every single cycle. That would be quite a spectacular museum piece uh, if it all works. I'm looking forward to it, so stay tuned. I will come back as soon as I have more to say. In the meantime, take care.